That's actually not as funny as it was when I first told it 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Trial lawyers are so unpopular, I think people are waiting for the rest of that. Tim and I decided to write a book on unity. And I know what you're thinking. Y'all picked the craziest time in the world to write a book on unity. I agree that this is a curious time. But it's also a necessary time, and here's what I want to do. We could have written a book about policy, or he could have. We could have written a book about conversations we've had with presidents or colleagues or you name it. But my heart is burdened because what used to be contracts, which is necessary and good and appropriate and a functioning democracy, that contrast has morphed into conflict. And Tim and I decided, you know what? We're not going to write a kiss and tell. We're not going to write fire and fury. We're not going to write whatever book Omarosa just wrote. We're going to write a book on unity and the need for it in our country. And I know when you look at that picture of me and Tim, you think, well, you guys are both in South Carolina. You're both in the same political party. You both have essentially the same political beliefs. What in the world? Would y'all need to write a book on unity? Let me first of all just celebrate the fact that a black man and a white man from the home of the Civil War could write a book together and the people in the media wonder what that would be. I want to celebrate that. But it also proves another point. No matter how much you may think people are seemingly similar, there are differences. And no matter how much you seem to think you have nothing in common with someone, I'm going to shock you with the fact that you have more in common with them than you would ever imagine. So Tim and I decided to write a book on unity. We decided, despite our similarities, to highlight some of our differences to prove the point. You saw the love. He uh, wears his hair very very short. Some people call it bald. Uh, I do not. I have been encouraged to explore that over here, but I have not uh, done it yet. He is built like a linebacker to play running back in college. I am built like a chess player and, and play golf if you consider golf to be a sport. Uh, a wife considers it to be uh, an addiction. <laughs> Tim grew up in a single parent household. His mother worked at the hospital 18 hours a day, changing bed pants. I have a family member that worked at a hospital too. Who's a doctor? He never changed his bed pants. Tim grew up worried about whether or not the bills were going to be paid. My sister Caroline and I never had to worry about whether or not a bill was going to be paid. Caroline and I grew up with both of our parents in the house. Tim and I had different experiences with law enforcement. I was a prosecutor before I came to Congress. I've never once been stopped by law enforcement except that I deserve to be stopped by law enforcement. Every experience I have ever had with law enforcement has been positive. Some were positive than others, but they've all been positive. Tim Scott, the United States Senator Tim Scott, was stopped seven times in one year. Now look at this. Who looks like they would be more trouble than that picture? <laughs> Seven times in one year. I do not wear a house pin. I don't wear a pin that identifies me as a member of the house. But yet I have never been denied entrance to a house building and I've never been stopped by the Capitol Police. Tim does wear a Senate pin. Not only was he stopped, they put their hands on him. So you can't come into this building. Senate pin on, Senate ID. We've had different experiences with law enforcement. 
We have similar but not identical religious beliefs. He is an eternal optimist. He believes the best in everyone. He is hopeful. I am a sinner and a skeptic, and I believe, as you would expect a former prosecutor to, I believe that man is capable of doing some really, really bad things. So I am rarely disappointed and rarely surprised. Tim is this non-stop, effervescent pool of optimism. Tim is single. He's been single his entire life. I've been married for 29 years. kindest, most beautiful person you will ever see in your life. I'll be happy to pass on the applause to her for sticking with me for 29 years of happy marriage. 28 for me and one for her. All together, it's 29. <laughs> Terry and I have two children. Tim has no children. Which means Tim has never experienced the joy of having a child ask you for money. <laughs> 20 minutes after you gave him some money. <laughs> Tim does not know what it's like to have a child that finished college with a philosophy degree that then just finished law school that came home from law school to say that he wants to become a professional golf. <laughs> Tim Scott puts up with things that are said about him that would never, ever, ever be said about most of us. I've never been called an Uncle Tom. I've never been called a token. I've never been called a prop. I've never had my blackness questioned. I have never been called a seller. I don't care what your position is on tax reform, and I really mean that. I do not care what your position is on tax reform. But Tim Scott was on the committee in the House that wrote the tax bill. It's called the House Ways and Means Committee. And then when he got elevated to the Senate, they put him on the Senate Finance Committee. That's where the senators write tax bill. And then Mitch McConnell decided to convene this special group of senators to write the tax reform bill, and he picked Tim Scott to be in that special group. And then when the House passed the version and the Senate passed the version, Tim Scott finds himself on what we call the Conference Committee, which is designed to reconcile the differences in those bills. And I cannot tell you the number of dinners where I'm at the table with either John Ratcliffe, who's a congressman from Texas, or Mia Love from Utah, or one of our colleagues, and Tim had to get up from the table to go discuss tax policy with one of his Senate colleagues. So, of course, when that bill is being signed into law at the White House, Tim Scott is going to be invited to the signing ceremony. No one deserved to be invited to the signing ceremony more than him. So there he is on the front row, which is exactly where he should have been. And they call him a prop. He's a token. We have some similarities. We have differences, and I realize the blueprints for our lives were different about four years ago and would forever be different. About four years ago, sitting at that same table we sit at every single night when we're in Washington together. Timmy decides to tell me a story about his 
grandfather, Mr. Harvest Ware. Mr. Ware, who lived to be 94 years of age, would hold up the Charleston Post and Courier at breakfast. He wanted to encourage his grandson. There was, there, there was no father in the household. Mr. Ware was the father family. So he would hold up the Charleston Post and Courier because he wanted Tim Scott to value education. Wanted Tim Scott to value current events. Wanted Tim Scott to stay in school and do well in school. So we modeled it. Hold up the local newspaper. You gotta stay engaged, stay involved, stay knowledgeable. And I couldn't resist. I said, you know, Tim, we, we got that in common. My dad did the same thing. My three sisters, they, different newspapers, Harvard Herald Journal, but he would do it every, every breakfast, hold it up. If you ask him a question, he might lower it, answer it, and raise it back up. I said, we, we got that in common, brother. Tim hung his head. Said the difference traits my grandfather couldn't read. Never wanted to read. Died not being able to read. Faith. Because he wanted to go from picking cotton, which is what. Arnold Square did for a little. <clears throat> they have a grandson to pick out a seat in the United States House of Representatives. I'll tell you, Mr. Ware, it worked. And Mr. Ware lived long enough to vote for a president of color under one political banner and vote for a grandson of color for the United States House, the United States Senate, under a different political banner. Yeah, we have similarities. We have differences. Our country was founded on contrast. I love contrast. I love the fact that Everybody don't want to eat at the same restaurant at exactly the same time. I like the fact that we can debate the size and scope of government. I like the fact that you have a different perspective on this issue than I have. The contrast is good. It is what makes life interesting. When that contrast becomes conflict, I'm afraid that's where we are. When people are thrown out of restaurants because of who they work for, when kids who have watched school shooting after school shooting after school shooting have a different view of the Second Amendment than us grown-ups, it is fine to debate it, but don't belittle it. we got to get back to having a conversation, and it can be animated, and it can be serious, and you can continue to hold your deeply held conviction. I'm not asking anybody to surrender any deeply held conviction. I'm not even asking you to surrender a lightly held conviction. we got to get back to the point where we can actually have a conversation about it without challenging one another's patriotism or challenging one another's motives. I saw some polling recently, which I'm initially uh, suspicious of. This one might actually be accurate. 66% of all self-identified Democrats do not have a Republican friend. 66% of all self-identified Republicans do not have a Democrat friend. So if you are struggling to understand how the other side could possibly believe what they believe, I don't know where better to go than to someone who actually believes it. And I'm lucky. I live with a 21-year-old socialist. <laughs> be very, very clear about this. That would be my daughter. 
not my wife. <laughs> My daughter has a shared with men in the back. My daughter has different views on a number of issues than what I have. Just like when I was 21, I had really different views than what I have right now. But there's no arguing in our house. First of all, it doesn't change people's minds. Arguing people doesn't, it doesn't work. Humiliating them, it doesn't work. If you're about the art of persuasion, Arguing and starting a fight is not very persuasive. So why unity? Why write a book on unity? And I know what you're thinking. Look, Gaddy, we're not in Congress. We're not on television. What do you want us to do about it? Here's what I'm asking you to do. I want you to eavesdrop while I, have, while I ask myself a question. It's not for you, it's for me. I want you to eavesdrop. Are you a Christian who happens to be involved and engaged in the political process? Or are you a Republican or a Democrat who happens to attend church? Hmm. Are you a Christian who happens to engage in the political process? Or are you a Republican or a Democrat who happens to attend church? That's the question that keeps coming back to me. When you hear the phrase people, does your mind rush to we the people, which is in the foundational document for our country, or does your mind rush to if my people, which is in the foundational document for life, which would be the Bible? Jesus Christ was the most unifying figure to ever walk on this earth. Think about the barriers that he broke down. For those who want to call themselves by his name, think of the barriers that he broke down. Gender barriers. He broke them. And I don't just mean talking to the woman at the well. Women were among the first to understand the purpose of his ministry, to acknowledge his deity. They were the last to leave him at the cross. They were the first to accept the fact that he had been resurrected. That was radical for his time. Socioeconomic boundaries. Jesus didn't have a ton of nice things to say about rich folks. Something about a camel, an eye of a needle. It's hard. The rich young ruler. It's a tough parable. Socioeconomic boundaries, racial boundaries, gender boundaries, religious boundaries. Anyone familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan? Every boundary you can think to break down, he broke down. Because unity is biblical. Then we'll know the verse. I will get part of it right, part of it not right. So I will ask you to forgive my paraphrase. But in Christ there is no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female. And I'll bet you if he were standing in front of you today, he would say there is no black, no white, no brown, no Republican, no Democrat, no Libertarian, no Independent. So he breaks down barriers. But there's one other thing that we could stand to have in our modern day culture as well. Which is someone to build some bridges. Think about it. Jesus bridged the chasm between you and God. He bridged the chasm between life and death. And he bridged the chasm between the temporal and the eternal. 
Those are three pretty important bridges. If we all we do in life is talk and associate with people that are on our side of the river, you don't need a bridge. If you're all living on the same side of the pond, you don't need a bridge. You will be stunned if you will do what Tim Scott and I decided to do. Overlook whatever differences may appear manifest. Whether it is a racial difference, whether it is a gender difference, whether it is a, there's a really big difference where I come from, and that's between the North and the South. That may be the hardest difference of all to overcome. Are you willing to overlook geographic differences? Unity is biblical, it is practical. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And I would add to that, a country divided against itself cannot stand. One of my favorite, I guess he's a theologian, he may be a political scientist, he may be a philosopher, he was kind of something of a renaissance man. He certainly wasn't perfect, but he was a smart guy. His name was G.K. Chesterton. He said, it is not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting, or found lacking, or found insufficient, it is that Christianity is really, really hard. Therefore, it is rarely tried. Think about that for a second. It's not that it's been tried and failed. It's that it's really, really hard. And therefore, it's rarely tried. Think about what your Christian faith asks you to do and how different it is from what modern day culture asks you to do. Love your enemies. What could possibly be more radical than that? Pray for those who persecute you. What could possibly be more radical than that? If someone asks for a shirt, give them your cloak too. That's why I keep asking myself, where's my identity? Is my identity in a political orthodoxy or is my identity in the person who said, blessed are the peacemakers? I'll tell you one more Tim Scott story. When we were freshmen, Connor, something terrible was written about him in a political blog. Uh, I have since learned not to go rush and tell all my friends when something terrible is written about him, but I didn't know that at the time. All I needed to let him know every single solitary negative thing that had been written by him. So I read this and I marched myself down to his office and I had the article in my hand and I went right past his receptionist said, Tim, we're going to do something like this. We're going to do something about it. I'm sick of it. I mean, you can say we're, you can say we're dumb. You can, you can say we're wrong. But this is libelous. It is defamatory. But we're going to do something about it. And he said, okay. Close the door. And I thought, this we're getting somewhere. I know. <laughs> Door closed. Tim said, we're going to pray for you. I'm not. I told him I'm not. And I did. But I listened as he did. Christianity is hard. 
It's hard. We're asked to do things that are really, really hard. But you're asked to do them by someone who also did really, really hard things. And you're asked to do them by someone who used really unconventional methods. Weapon from the bone of an animal. A stutterer as a spokesperson. Trumpets and lanterns as weapons. And the one that I focus on the very most, because it is the most apropos when it comes to politics, is he let his own son lose a popularity contest to a guy named Barabbas. Christianity is hard. There are people who are willing to try it. What I would respectfully ask of you, even in this tense, divisive political time that we are in, is to appreciate the biblical virtue of unity and test my and Tim's theory. That if you get to know someone, despite the differences that may exist perceptionally, you will find that you have about 80% of life in common. It's just for whatever reason we rush to the 20% that we don't. And if you want to change this country, it will not be with a political platform. It will not be with an election. It will be when we begin to do what Mr. Chesterton said was really hard to do. Love your name. Pray for those who persecute you. Blessed are the peacemakers. You'll change a community. You'll change a country. That's why Tim and I wrote it. We hope that you will join us. I'm getting out. He's staying in. But I hope that you will join us as we try to somehow become the United States of America. Again, God bless you.